Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're joining us from in the world. My name is Andreas Carlson. I'm Director of Communication at Stockholm International Water Institute. And uh, I'm happy to participate and moderate this discussion that we'll have today. I'm in New York, uh, just a few blocks away from uh, United Nations headquarters. Now, today marks the first day of a very important week for water. Uh, the world is gathering for a UN conference on the management of fresh water for the first time in 46 years. That is a long time. When the previous conference opened uh, in March in 1977 in Mar del Plata, I was four days old. Today, as the world regathers for a new UN water conference, I'm starting to see some gray around the temples and in my beard. So it has been a long wait. Uh, it may of course seem a bit strange that we start this week with an event that's called What's Next? So looking beyond the conference before it has even started. But there is a reason for that. There's a good reason for it. We know that the UN Water Conference this year, it will not end with a global treaty on the management of fresh water. This conference is a conference about promises, about making commitments, voluntary commitments, aiming towards action, but not the action itself. So when we all leave New York at the end of this week, what we will have essentially is a very long to-do list a to-do list which is referred to as the Water Action Agenda. So where do we start ticking off that list? How do we do that? How do we make sure that all the beautiful words said this week, and I think it's fair to say that there will be quite a few of them, how do we make sure that the momentum that they signal is not lost? We have a wonderful lineup of people who will help us talk about this today and their expectations from this weekend also further uh, beyond the week. Uh, I will introduce them as we go along and uh, we will start in Delhi with Sunita Narayan. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank uh, you. You're Director General for the Center uh, for Science and Environment and in that role also 2005 Stockholm Water Prize Laureate. Uh, perhaps first you could just say a few words about what is the Center for Science and Environment? So the Center for Science and Environment, CSC for short, is a public interest research group. That's a mouthful, but if you see us, we are really a group which looks at the, the issues of development, the issues of environment, the interface that it has with people in our countries, and then looks at how do we move ahead. So we're a group which, which really pushes for both understanding the state of the crisis, but most importantly, um, bringing awareness about the need to act and act fast and how. So in that sense, you are of course looking forward to what's happening this week and what it will lead to. What, what, is, what is your thought? Why do you think that it has taken 46 years for the world to regather under the UN umbrella to talk about fresh water? Andreas, I think the fact is many of these issues are really taken, being taken out of the hands of governments as well as UN agencies. I think, you know, quite frankly, the UN is late to the game today. Uh, the issue of water is so central in our world, but it has become even more central because of climate change. The huge impact that we are seeing in our countries uh, because of the impact of climate change is on our water regime. And it's not because you have these horrifying pictures of drying up or, or you know, or apocalypse. It's an apocalypse, which is a living apoc ap apocalypse. We are seeing increased rainfall. Now increased precipitation means that you don't have the ability to be able to hold the water. You essentially have floods and then prolonged periods of drought. Unseasonal rainfall, extreme rainfall has huge impacts on farmers. They see their crops going down. As I speak to you, Andreas, 
in my country, we are seeing today hailstorms happening in different parts, destroying crops. We've seen huge flooding happening in other parts, unseasonal. It's not even the beginning of the monsoon season. So I think water today is so central to the issues of development and has become even more important because of the impacts of climate change. And that's something that we see in our world. We also see in our world the fact that over the last many decades, we have innovated. We have experimented with new ways of being able to do community-based management of water, to look at water prudent crops, to reduce the demand for water, and most importantly, to look at sewage and water connections so that you can reuse and recycle every drop of water. So for me, the UN conference should be both a recognition of the extraordinary innovation that we have seen in the countries of the South to change the paradigm, the resource intensive, capital intensive, private sector driven paradigm of water management on one hand, and on the other hand, a recognition of the urgency to act fast because with climate change, we are only going to see more and more the need to have sustainable water management. And that is something that we need to understand today. Haven't we talked about this urgency for a very long time now? Quite frankly, Andreas, we have not. I think the water agenda goes through what you call peaks and troughs. I think for some years ago, there was a peak on the water agenda when the world discussed the issue of drinking water, the issue of sanitation. It got embodied in the sustainable development goals. But I think today, Climate change is also making us understand that the water crisis is not just a crisis in the countries of the South. We are seeing droughts across the developed world. We are seeing today the fact that you could have scarcity of water and the need to re-engineer, rework your water systems. That has grown. To me, Andreas, the crisis is not the problem. The problem is our mindset in which we have not been able to look at new solutions to be much more water wise, much more water prudent, and to be much more waste wise. And I think that's really where the answers need to be discussed. I think the world is tired of discussing problems. We need to discuss how the solutions are emerging and how those solutions are being scaled up. At least in my world, I can tell you, we can see scaling up happening of an alternative paradigm of water and waste. And I think today the global community needs to sit up and understand that that is happening and the urgency has become even more because of climate change. The link between water and climate change is something that we do not make as strongly as we should. And as I said in the beginning there, uh, this conference is very much designed around commitments, voluntary commitments. Uh, from all sorts of stakeholders, what commitments would you like to see coming out of the UN Water Conference? And by who? <laughs> that's a very, you know, quite Andreas, that's the most difficult question. I, I honestly feel that the biggest commitment that I want to see is that we practice change at scale and that we recognize the fact that today the backs of poor communities are really broken because of years of COVID, impoverishment, marginalization, and now climate change. And the fact that the global community needs to understand the dire situation and make a promise that we are going to fix it, whether it means concessional finance, whether it means a recognition of doing things differently, or whether it just means that we will put water and climate change and at the center of what we will do. I don't know who needs to make those commitments, Andreas, because the global community, quite frankly, is a world too far. But, and I have seen too many commitments not being um, 
country is not really adhering to the commitments they make. I think for me, the most important issue today is the fact that the world should come together to recognize the urgency and put a human face on the crisis of water and climate change. But this is also the tricky part, isn't it? To, to recognize that, but then to move from that to actual action, yeah. doing something, which is what we talk about. But I think how action is not... How, how do you see that thing? Sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Andreas. I was just going to say, I don't think action is necessarily only because we are going to get another you know, SDG framework. I think action has to be the recognition that this action is happening at many scales in many countries of the world. And that what we need is supporting, enabling mechanis uh, mechanis uh, uh, mechanisms to make sure that this can be scaled up, recognition that it's happening in the countries and at the global level, because, you know, water is an issue which is a country matter. It is not something that I, I can only see the global community coming together to say each country um, is acting and this is what we can do to make it better and that we need to make sure that the issues of loss and damage and climate change, which is very much to do with water, the issues of adaptation and climate change, those issues are not going to be neglected. I don't think we need a new set of commitments, a new set of financial promises that don't come true. I think what we need is to make sure that the global community can make the link strongly, firmly with the need to link um, the need for um, changes, adaptation uh, to the crisis of water scarcity, and abundance flooding in our parts of the world. Thank you, Sunita. Thank you very much. Uh, I will turn now back to New York to the two gentlemen joining us, I believe, further south in Manhattan from where I am. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Mark. Uh, Global Water Business Leader at Arup. Can you perhaps first say a few words about what Arup is and why water is so important to you? Uh, yeah, Arup, uh, an employee-owned uh, cooperative, it's a private consultancy. Um, sustainable development's right at the heart of what we do, and I lead the Global Water Business. That's a community of over 1,700 water professionals within a, a, a business of about, as I say, about 19,000. Uh, we work all across the water cycle, um, so all aspects of water. Uh, I think the UNFCCC tell us over 90% of the impacts of climate change are across the water cycle. I think we see climate change as an existential threat to humankind, and um, that urgency doesn't seem to have been grasped uh, and, and unless you're uh, really at the, at the sharp end of feeling the impacts. Um, I'm not sure what more evidence we need of country scale, city scale, uh, events like a cloud burst in Copenhagen, country scale flooding in Pakistan and Peru, or continental uh, scale droughts like we've just had in Europe or in Australasia. I mean, um, we don't need Nostradamus to tell us that we're getting more extreme extremes and those extremes are becoming more frequent. So from our perspective, we're part of what I see as a thin blue line activating to champion water and what we can do in water uh, and trying to get some common purpose across the whole supply chain, public and private and third part, uh, third sector to try and get everybody working together. Um, I do sense urgency. Uh, I don't, it's not react and chaos. I think it's more about how can we be wise and clever but we can't keep kicking promises into long grass i think we should get a strimmer cut the long grass down and ensure that we're starting to deliver action i think that's my message that i'm bringing to new york i hope so as a starter for 10 that's that's where we are andreas um and sustainable for me sustainable development is increasingly looking towards restorative uh solutions that put back some of the negatives that we've uh, created in the past 
and then regenerative ones are sort of rebirth where we can try and get real value for local communities but uh, confidence at a, a local regional and national level that we can do something about this but we'll only do it together in in, in my experience yeah. and can i ask you, you you've been as most of this uh, panel, uh, regular to events similar to this, such as World Water Week, for instance, we'll come back to that in a minute, but how would you say that the way we talk about water has changed over these years that, that you've been involved? I think um, we've gone from the conceptual to a bit more, to a bit more of the practical, which is has been really important for me. Concepts are fine, but I think people have to say, well, OK, well, what can I do at a national, regional or local level or even at a personal level? What the sort of decisions I can make that can contribute to a collective difference? So I think if I've seen anything, it's that shift. Um, I've seen it come through the uh, dialogues that we've had at the COP, through the COP process, where at COP21 we weren't. I think we had the first public event with Siri on in water that we were involved in with Agua. Uh, so it was actually now having a water pavilion by COP26 and using that pavilion for really constructive dialogue with good examples of practical action that I've seen at COP27 when we were at uh, Sharm El Sheikh. So I think, I think that's all working and I think that's positive. I just... Um, it feels like there's just the enlightened few rather than the committed masses. And I think that the impacts of climate change are so significant and so severe for our very existence that uh, we need more shoulders to the wheel, if you like. And part, maybe we've got to champion the case. Maybe we haven't articulated it enough in, or well enough in the past, but we have to keep the language simple and we have to just think about what we can all contribute to and how that all can connect together uh, to get some synergy, I think. And what are your hopes and expectations for, for this week, which is the UN Water Conference, but also many related events uh, related to water? Um, I, hope that, I hope that we don't just get more promises kicked into long grass or timescales extended. I'd like people to commit to action. Mm. When I say action, we've we've just responded to a, a national flooding in Peru, and we're working in seventeen river basins and seven cities. Now that's action. That's adaptation at the sharp end. But what we're trying to do is build capacity within the country for people to solve their own problems, and where we can transfer ideas and technology like an early warning system or something that can save lives or reduce damage to property, that we're trying to uh, share that openly and freely because, um, you know, we, the, the more that we can focus on the 20% of the interventions that will give us 80% of the benefit, that, that sort of pragmatism, then the better. But um, we, we should be sharing good ideas and best practice and uh, practical action uh, as freely as possible, because the urgency is increasing by the day. And who are, you touched on it briefly, but who are the key players in, in your view uh, in achieving this? I think we need, we need national champions. Um, and I think to a certain extent, that's both individuals and organisations. I think the Dutch have done a, an excellent job. Somebody like Henk or Tajikistan, where they've stood up and they've taken responsibility. I think that, uh, Swedish, through organisations like SUI, are very good at uh, lending their shoulder to that collective wheel. I think we need public and private sector, and I'd like to think that Arab are part of that private sector contribution. But I think we all have to bring something. Um, the United Nations shouldn't be a talk shop. I think it should very much be an action-orientated, outcome-focused um, uh, enabler. And I'd like to think that we're all here because of that. And for many of us who've been championing this for a number of years, you know, it, it, we've got to keep hope. We've got to, we, we've got to um, uh, uh, try and uh, capture that enthusiasm and mobilise that essential action because communities 
uh, are, are vulnerable and being impacted by the day. And it's really important that uh, all the actions that we take are reducing the impact on those communities. And I think that's the most important aspect. And the environment as well. Yeah. So yeah. communities and the environment that we've neglected for too long. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah. And it brings us nicely to, to Thomas, who's in the, the room with you there, uh, director of Swedish Waterhouse at CUE. Uh, and this is, there's a reason, of course, why you are in the same room, uh, Thomas. This is something that you work quite a lot with, uh, bringing different kinds of stakeholders together. How do you see that happening? How do you, what are the challenges and what are the possibilities when it comes to bring very different stakeholders, actors, and also very different interests? together for a joint course. I, I um, referring to what what um, uh, we spoke about earlier with when what Sunita also referred to that that the the mechanisms to work together hasn't properly been there and maybe there's been a a search for those mechanisms within the different sectors and if you take um, the civil society and the governmental part of it uh, there are interlinks, but to the private sector has has been few, and uh, I believe there is there is now the prerequisites to actually start building for that because there is new regulations, there is new um, uh, uh, sort of uh, European uh, regulations coming into this, like the taxonomy. So the 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 private sector and the, the, the civil society and the political part of it as well from a governmental or national perspective is coming is coming to a, a center point where we actually can start to work together. Um, but I, I fully agree that I, I to also what, what Sunita said that we don't need new, we need to work on what we have because there, the technology is there, the, the mechanisms are there now. <laughs> And and the engagement is there. We just need to get those together to to actually create the action. Um, so um, so in that sense, I, I I think we we have we have an arena to to actually join arms and 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 uh, fulfill this. And, and what role is CWE aiming to play in this process? Well, CWE is. I mean, we're we're. I joined CV in June last year. Uh, I would say that CV is um, is an organization with experts, but also uh, we have a very strong convening role where we can actually be instrumental in bringing those parties together. Uh, whether it's the World Water Week or or it could be the the, the water pavilion at the at the uh, conference of the parties, the next one, for example, as we did. For, for COP26 and COP27, um, but in, in other um, occasions and, and um, meeting places as well. So I think in that, in that sense, we can be a convener and a facilitator on bringing parties together to actually create agreements to make the commitments needed and also um, create the action uh, from that. I, I sort of think of Siri as bringing strands together to form string and string together to form rope. Mm. And it's only by bringing that together can we collectively work together in strength to effect really effect, effective action, which is what we're all interested in. Yeah, there's a there's a wonderful book called Breeding um, uh, um, uh, Grass. I can't remember what kind of grass it is. Now. I read the book. Uh, but I think in that sense we are we're we're breathing together uh, all those strings and and hopefully that will create the action and that's the ambition we have. And what are your hopes for the week, Thomas? I'm very much looking forward to to actually go into the commitments. I know this is not a, an, an agreement week, but that we actually have the commitments published. We have them not only as individual organizations, but in collaboration between organizations and not only one or two organizations, but actually on a multilateral perspective. And I hope that that they are so strong and so clear uh, that we can use those as stepping stones for the next coming conference in Bonn or the high level political forum, the World Water Week, of course. We hope that World Water Week can be an arena for non-state members to actually 
uh, agree on those commitments and and um, and then bring that on to COP to have it also in the resolutions. So um, yeah, that, that, that's uh, what I would say is a very compromised uh, uh, description of what, what my wishes. And, and see is coming into the conference here now in New York with commitments of our own. Uh, it's a fairly long list, but can you perhaps say something about <laughs> what sort of commitments that is? I mean, I mean, it's so clear for us. I, we've just spoken about this positioning paper. I showed it to to uh, Mark this morning, um, and and I'm very happy that we now have the first ever. And thank you for the collaboration around that, Andreas. You've been instrumental in this as well, together with the rest of the management team at CV. But the, the the there is no. I mean, we've already spoken about what is key in in a role in in climate and how strong it is. Um, and and how many of the 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 floods and storms that are are now happening is actually doubled in relation to just ten years ago because of the climate crisis and 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 the effect it has on on people on the ground and 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 all the other issues we've been into. But to give you a few a, a little taste, I would say that we would like the water governance to be and the role for water governance for, for climate mitigation and adapted to be included in the COP. Um, that is that is a want we have. We want climate finance to reach the levels agreed at the last COP uh, or the previous COPs uh, to be able to uh, achieve those um, uh, the balance between ad adaptation and mitigation. And, and we want countries to further incorporate water in, in climate adaptation and mitigation strategies and programs and funding. So the, what we commit to do is that we support countries to develop resilient services in the countries where we work, and this by improving uh, climate and water policies, developing capacity and supporting their implementation. And we commit to do the, this with at least 10 countries on an annual basis. And, and also to support advocacy for wash mitigation opportunities as well as adaptation needs. Um, by coordinating and convening high level events uh, like the ones I've just mentioned and developing campaigns, policy briefs, papers and, and reports and others, com communication related uh, outputs, outreach that is appropriate. And, and we, we offer the World Water Week to be an arena to facilitate and, and promote and review these cross-sectoral and non-state member commitments um, for the water action agenda ahead. That was a short brief. We, it's a long paper. It is a long paper. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we'll, we'll stay in New York. Uh, we'll go to Virginia Rope, uh, Senior Advisor at Sanitation and Water for All. Uh, pretty self-explanatory name to the organization, of course, but please tell us a little bit of what it is that you do. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation uh, to be here today. Um, unfortunately, Katerina Dabokirki can't be here because she's in uh, the SWA steering committee. So uh, you've got me. Uh, and I'm very happy, happy to tell for you. It. Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm very happy to tell you what we do at Sanitation and Water for All for those who don't know. We're a UN based uh, multi stakeholder global platform working on sanitation and water for all. We have over 300 partners, including, um, I think at the moment, 80 country, so 80 governments are uh, members of SWA. We are, I mean, the name says it all, we're here for sanitation and water for all. We place human rights really at the center of our work. So one of the one of the areas that we're really um, pushing for is is for um, human rights to be better understood and to be implemented, obviously in line with also with the SDGs. Um, we are, uh, we with along with our focus on uh, human rights, obviously is a very strong focus on the elimination of inequalities. And so I'm glad that people have already been talking about vulnerable populations. Uh, and obviously in the context of climate change, it's, it's those communities which are suffering the most. But what I really want to, uh, shall I, is there more I should talk about SWA? I mean, there's- I can ask you questions as well. I mean- you, Otherwise I'll just keep going and tell you what no, I No, that's to... fine. Uh, I, I, I'll, ask you, I'll ask you this. I mean, obviously uh, with what you just described, you keep a close eye on the SDGs and many of them, I'm sure, some of them spring to mind more than others, such as SDG six, for instance. But from your perspective, how are we doing? So, I think that one of the
what is the role of accountability? What we're not seeing often is, well, we're seeing a lot of commitments being made. And, and in the case of the uh, uh, Water Action Agenda, it's wonderful to see so many commitments coming in um, from governments and, and from uh, other actors. But I think what we're not seeing um, is what's going to happen with those commitments. And so I just want to talk a little bit about what we have at uh, SWA, which we're hoping to link together with, with the UN Water Action Agenda which is, we call it the mutual accountability mechanism. And the reason we call it the mutual accountability mechanism is that we have this multi-stakeholder platform where at the national level, but also at the global level, as I say, there's a steering committee meeting happening right now um, in the next room, is an opportunity to bring all of the different actors together. And we, we know from experience that the only way to really make progress is to bring everybody's needs and solutions to the table. So we have uh, civil society organizations working together with uh, national governments, working together with private sector, with research and learning institutions, and obviously also with the donors, whether it's the bilateral donors or whether it's people like Gates. And, and making, that, making that space to have a conversation with all of the different um, uh, actors. Now, on top of that, as one of the things that SWA has always been very keen on is to make sure that there is accountability there. And accountability has then become one of the uh, conversation points for those multi-stakeholder platforms. So there are commitments being made by national governments which are being agreed to with the civil society organizations. And the civil society organizations are also making commitments about what they will do to help governments achieve uh, what they've promised, but it also gives a very strong opportunity for civil society to, to come to the table uh, after the event of having made the commitments and saying, so what are you actually doing a year later, two years later? Have you achieved those commitments? Let us see progress on that. And it's, it's, it's an opportunity to really um, strengthen civil society as well, because we know that one of the problems we have at the moment is a shrinking of civic space. It's happening all over the world. Civil society is not giving, being given the space to, to interact either with government or to work with social media. We know that hum, human rights defenders are often under threat. Um, media is, is, is being censored, and we see it, as I say, all over the world. As, uh, I don't think that's um, under debate. So this opportunity for civil society to really engage with uh, governments is really critical. So one of the things that we're offering at this UN Water Conference is to take these vol voluntary commitments, as we have seen, and take the ones and, and go to those the, to the organizations and the governments that are making voluntary commitments and say, would you like to join us in our mutual accountability mechanism, put those commitments into our database where everybody can see what they are and can come afterwards and and uh, join these multi-stakeholder platforms to really have a conversation at eye level. So uh, where civil society, private sector donors can uh, are talking at eye level with um, with the local with the national governments. And I just want to give an example of how we see this being effective. We're having a session here in New York uh, on the mutual accountability mechanism, and we've got thirty one ministers of water and sanitation are attending that session. They take this seriously. They, uh, they take it seriously that they make a commitment and then they attend and they listen. Not just It's not just the ministers who will be speaking. There's also opportunities for civil society to engage. And in fact, in one case, I think the government has even said that the civil society can speak on their behalf because the minister won't be able to attend. So it's, it's this opportunity of engagement between, it's not just government promises, they have to be held to account. Otherwise we don't have the progress that we need. Thank you. Do, do you see any, that's very interesting. Thank you, Virginia. It's, uh, do you see any pattern in what countries you get to the table at this point? So SWA has been working longest probably with uh, countries in Africa. We have probably 44 or 45 uh, African countries which are members of SWA, which out of a you know continent with fifty six countries, that's that's a very strong, um, strong showing. Uh, what what we see is um, in certain countries, we really see a lot of progress with these multi stakeholder platforms. There's there's a lot of excitement around them. It's rejuvenating joint sector review processes. Um, I, I would also say, you know, I, I want to stress that SWA is a partnership organization. So I'm speaking to you here from the Secretariat, but we are driven by our partners. So 
it's not the secretariat that's doing the work. I'm just conveying it to you today. Uh, but we we have that opportunity for um, for partners to drive this. I mean, that, that, it's not easy. I, I just want to stress that this is we've been working on accountability processes for the last uh, 12 years that we've been in existence. It's a long and slow and difficult process. I don't want to make it sound as if it's plain sailing and, and everyone reports on their commitments without any any difficulties. But it does make a conversation. Uh, it does start a conversation and, and it's the discussions and the openness and the trust that we're building that that makes uh, that that makes change possible. Why is it such a such a slow process? Why isn't this happening faster? So it's difficult making commitments. It's difficult to get uh, donor organizations to uh, to be open enough. It's difficult to get um, governments to commit. You know, we've got we've got ministers here and we've got obviously they're also working with their directors uh, of, of the departments that they're from. Um, it's not an easy process to make a commitment and then be held to it. I mean, we know that politicians particularly like to make promises and then perhaps not meet them or maybe they're not, you know, it's a four-year process. But it's a really long, it's it's a long process it, and, and um, it's it's not easy to be held to account, you know, and, and deciding what commitments to be, to, make, be, to be made is also difficult. So we have commitments about financing, about system strengthening, about the in, in, enabling environment. I would say that's our main, main focus because that's who we are as SWA. We have to, commitments on meeting inequalities and looking at how, how you can reach vulnerable populations and on gender and so on. But these are not easy subjects. None of this is, you know, the, these these are there are reasons why uh, vulnerable populations don't have access to water and sanitation, and it's not necessarily financial. It can be due to stigma and discrimination, and a lot of very difficult subjects. So um, that's, I guess, and I think that's also why the UN Water Conference is talking about voluntary commitments because it is, it's, it's it, you know, it's it's hard to get governments uh, to to um, make a strong commitment that can be seen by the whole world but that's also the strength of it these are yeah. these are visible to everybody these are globally visible commitments and we can all we all have something to do to hold ourselves to account but also to hold each other to account for the promises we make thank you virginia thank you uh, for giving us that very concrete uh, look into what could happen in the future uh, we'll stay in new york we'll go to uh, susan hollingdorfi uh, acting director, World Water Week yes. at CUE. Uh, I said at the beginning that it's been 46 years since the world gathered uh, as we are gathering now in New York. And while that is true for the sort of UN, uh, UN under the UN umbrella, it's not that we don't have uh, venues, arenas to talk about water issues, isn't it? Can you, can you tell us how Greg, does World Water Week fit into this? I thought you were going to ask about my graying hair since 1977, but I <laughs> appreciate that question didn't come. Of course, we have World Water Week and we've been uh, having meeting in Stockholm uh, since 1991. Uh, and of course, this year we will be doing so again. Uh, this year we are going to focus on innovation. The theme is innovation uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, social system processes, um, and we're hoping that that everyone will join. Um, we will also, and I want to tell the gate, the date. Uh, it's August twentieth through twenty fourth this year, and um, we are looking to have uh, a lot more inclusion also this year because we offer free participation uh, for online participants. Uh, and uh, that we can do thanks to uh, the subsidized, of course, from our partners and, and also session organizers. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to offering up a meeting space, really, uh, for follow-up conversations to the UN conference this year. Um, so we are really looking for more collaboration, uh, more inclusion, and, and hopefully more solutions. So based on the conversations that start here in New York this week. I was just going to ask that because obviously seeing World Water Week in the light of the UN Water Conference happening in New York now, how do you see that connection? What, what is the connection between the two events? 
I think it's a well, the, the similar stakeholders, you know, the same stakeholders have been coming to World Water Week uh, for years. Uh, in addition, we also offer up other participants, of course, outside of the UN uh, delegates. Uh, but this is important uh, also that we offer a uh, meeting space for, for everyone else. Uh, yeah. So not to just keep it to the, the stakeholders or the delegates at the UN. Um, we want our uh, World Water Week is more inclusive um, so that every voice can be brought to the discussion. Uh, and this year also I mentioned the free online participation. We hope that that would also uh, include more uh, participants from low and middle income countries that may not be able to travel to Stockholm. It's not that easy for everyone to do so. So we want to, to keep the conversation going. And I think that that is the, the, the difference, but also the, a stepping stone to the, the following uh, year's discussions. And we have already seen uh, very much of an inclusion and diversity in the conference when it then was back uh, to be organized physically again after the, the pandemic. Can you say a few words about the diversity that we'll, we'll see at, at World War II? Sure, well, we have, we really focus on um, the diversity of speakers um, and we have something we call the gold standard. So we're looking for 40%, at least 40% speakers are women. And, and we have actually reached that and, and more. So we have a good uh, diversity as far as gender. Uh, so we are looking at a 50, 50. And we also have a lot of young people participating. And, and for us, young people are 35 and under. Uh, and the last World Water Week in 2022, we had 37% participation from young people. And we really want to uh, really encourage that again. Um, and the, I think that, that also the session, uh, the sessions are also organized by more and more different kinds of organizations. Uh, we're seeing more and more um, interest from the private sector as well uh, to participate. Uh, and this is what most uh, sectors are looking for. So really it's a multi-sector conference. And, uh... <clears throat> I spoke earlier about leaving this conference with a very long to-do list and the to-do list is very good, but then you need to start ticking it off. What is your, what, what are your hopes for the immediate future after the UN uh, Water Conference? Wow, that's a tough question, I think. Uh, um, I think we'll see at the end of the week. Um, of course, we all wanna see promises, uh, but the how to and who and when uh, are going to be, these are going to be discussions that we have to continue. Um, and that is something that we hope that, that session organizers will bring to World Water Week. Uh, I also want to do a little bit of a pitch. Uh, we still have some open um, submissions. We, the submission is also still open for online sessions uh, and talk shows, and that's open till April 12th. So I hope that's okay that I pitch that to everyone. So anyone, any organization, anyone who want to be uh, included at World Water Week and want to engage uh, after this week, uh, please do so um, and apply for sessions at World Water Week. We welcome everyone. And we should perhaps say also, you, you touched on it very briefly there, the, the theme for this year, which is innovation. And that is to be understood in a very broad sense, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, so absolutely. I think, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the innovation theme, uh, our scientific program committee that selects the theme every year, um, are looking at, they're really looking at a holistic approach to innovation. Uh, I know that it's also a cultural thing, what you consider innovation. So in the Nordic countries specifically, um, we often look at technical innovation only. Uh, but this is really about social innovation, processes, systemic, we want to include the governance in that, of course, uh, and product level innovation as well. So we really want to have a, a, a holistic approach to innovation. Um, what does it mean um, is, is a, you know, that's, a, that's the, the real issue is to bring real innovation solutions. And, and I, my preference is to have like the people power part of innovation. So that's really what we can 
bring uh, as World Water Week is to really bring collaboration. Um, so that's what we're hoping for. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and we'll finish this discussion by going to uh, Canada, to a place called, I'll have to look in my notes, Samia. Uh, Annabelle, uh, leaving you to last, there's a reason for it. Uh, I think that you are in many ways the most important participant in the discussion here today. Uh, but first, tell us, where are you in Canada? Where is Samia? Where is Samia not from? Um, well, hello, and thank you again so much for having me on. And to be honest, the imposter syndrome has hit in a little bit. Um, there's been so many incredible panelists today, and I'm honored to be a part of this. I am calling from a bright, sunny morning in Sarnia, Ontario. So I'm in the southwestern region of Sarnia, Ontario, surrounded by the Great Lakes. There we go. And I'll introduce you, of course. Uh, you are the 2022 winner of the Stockholm Junior Water Prize. Uh, being awarded at the uh, World Water Week uh, in August last year, and a passionate water scientist. Uh, I, will, I will ask you to initially just say a few words. I know you have a very personal story of why and how you got involved in, in water science. Can you please tell us? Absolutely. So growing up in southwestern Ontario around the Great Lakes, I have a deep appreciation for our environment and especially water. In fact, my father is actually a commercial fisherman. And so sometimes in the summer, I'd grow up and I'd go along fishing with him. And I got to have a really deep firsthand knowledge of the Great Lakes and fishing aquatic organisms. Additionally, my mom is a retired college and high school biology professor. So I was able to go, come home from my learnings at the lake and then ask for millions of questions and learn more. And so with my, I'm a very curious person. And so with that nature, I uh, decided to enter the science, local science fair once I was old enough. And every year my projects have always been on the environment, sustainability and helping people. Specifically, I've always focused on areas of water science. And when a harm, the issues of harmful algae blooms, which are large growths of algae, started impacting the Great Lakes and other aquatic ecosystems in my region, due to their toxins, it caught, had a huge impact on the commercial fishing industry and as well as my father's health and safety. So I wanted to find a way to treat and prevent them to ensure clean water access and healthy lakes for all, and also to protect the fishing industry. Brilliant. Uh... And I said that you are probably the most important, and the reason is, of course, that you represent the young generation, the young scientists in your case, but ultimately the young decision makers, the, the young representatives of, of private sector, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's why I think it will be very valuable to hear your thoughts here towards the end. And uh, firstly, just relating back to, to Stockholm Union Water Prize, what, what did that, what was your experience from that? What, did it mean to you? Absolutely. So it was definitely easily the best week of my life. I was actually, I was in grade eight when I first learned of what the Stockholm Junior Water Prize was and how there was a Canadian Stockholm Junior Water Prize. And at the National Science Fair, uh, a senior project would win it based if they did a water science project and they could qualify to travel all the way to Sweden for this magical science fair entirely focused on water. And I remember sitting there at the award ceremony and sitting beside my mom and I looked at her and I'm like, I wanna be there one day and I wanna do that. Uh, fast forward to a few years later when I was doing my research on harmful algae blooms and I was able to self-nominate for the award. And then I went on to win the Canadian Stockholm Junior Water Prize. So I packed up my bags and I headed off to Stockholm, Sweden. And for me, it was actually the first time I ever left the, con uh, the continent in North America. So I was able to be exposed to new cultures and different people. And I will be honest, I was a little terrified that it'd be a really cutthroat environment coming into it. But all the participants from around the world, they were so lovely. They wanted to ask you a hundred questions. You wanted to ask them a hundred questions. It was a beautiful environment for learning and growing. And we all had fun together between like, at karaoke in our hotel rooms late at night or touring the museums. It was just a beautiful experience to be surrounded and meet people just as passionate about water and helping people as I was. And in fact, it's their passion, their dedication, their research and enthusiasm for using science to bring about social justice and help solve water. that brings me great hope for the future. And we should perhaps say also, I didn't really, but that Stockholm Union Water Prize, it is a competition. It's 40 something countries uh, participating each year with national competitions and the finalists participating in the final in Stockholm during World War II, which is what you won uh, last year. Uh, having listened to the discussion here with somewhat older water professionals, uh, I think you'd be forgiven for thinking, yeah, yeah, whatever, we've heard that all of that before. Is that so? What is your reflection listening to? The discussion uh, for the past 50 minutes or so? 
Um, well, it's been lovely to hear all of these different insights and perspectives from people from different areas and industries. One pattern that I started to notice was they wanted to hear from the conference this week less about promises and long-term goals and more about direct action and impact. And as a young person and speaking on behalf of a lot of young people and youth scientists, that's what we like. We like action. We like directly doing things. Because what happens is when we hear the like jibber jabber about things for a long period of time, we kind of get bored and move on to something else. Um, so I can definitely say that I think by introducing and including young people in the picture that we can actually work together to bring about more action and different perspectives because we see things differently from our backgrounds. And how do we do that? Everyone says they claim that we want to include young people in the discussion. We want them to be involved. It's not always happening. What's your solution? How do we go about actually achieving that? Absolutely. Well, I believe it's opportunities such as the Stockholm Junior Water Prize and through conferences and events, and even, for example, inviting me to come attend and speak to these events today, or directing communication and report the news articles at you. That's by educating us and engaging us and providing opportunities for us to participate or even sit around and be in fly on a wall just to listen and observe. I think it's creating doors that we can open and that are open and welcoming for us to enter. And looking at this conference this week, I know that you were initially planning to be here. Uh, you're not, but still, what is your expectation from this week and the commitments being made, etc.? Absolutely. Uh, to echo a common theme for the, the presentation, it's definitely action um, and acting on the reports and knowledge that we have. Additionally, I'm hoping to hear a lot more about nature-based solutions. That's actually what my research is on. I firmly believe that, that by using nature to solve and improve nature, we can actually mitigate risk in finding solutions and create an overall more sustainable planet. Very concise. If, 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 you, if you look into the future yourself, if you look beyond the water conference, and into the future, which you will have a bit more than the rest of us. Yes, what do you see as the most urgent action that must happen? Oh, that is a very tough question. Um, speaking especially from the perspective, uh, uh, from a female's perspective and youth perspective, I think it's ensuring that we have clean, clean and accessible water every area of the globe. It doesn't matter if you're a rural area, a larger city, um, rich country, or a poorer or developing country, everyone should have access to water. So that way we don't have to, well, that way it mitigates and uh, limits illness. It um, can improve our agriculture. And by having access to it, of course, we can empower a woman um, so they don't have to walk for water or for other instances. And so that way there's a more equal and equitable world. Equitable world. And what role would you like to play in all of this? Absolutely. Uh, generally, I'm very, very passionate about social justice, science, and actually politics and government. So I believe I would love to play a bridge between all of these three positions to help use science to drive about social justice and then use that to impact policy to help and support those in need. And so if you could address all the delegates coming to New York for the UN Water Conference, what would be your message to them? Don't be afraid to take the first few steps because you will find people just as passionate and dedicated as you are, and you will even inspire people to join you and start their own initiatives on the way. Uh, in order to, it truly takes a village, and in order to make the sweeping changes that we need to solve water um, and to maintain water, especially in our freshwater environments, we all need to pitch in and take the steps together. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, I think that's a very nice ending to what I think has been a very Interesting discussion, uh, and I would like to thank all of you participants. I see that there has been a long conversation in the chat on the side. Uh, I have not kept an eye on it during this uh, event, but I will definitely read up and I encourage everyone to do that. And I wish everyone who is participating in uh, the events in York this week a good week. And uh, let's see you all further down the line in other events, such as World War II, for instance. Thank you very much.